Welcome everyone. We're certainly excited to have you here at this third session of the faculty lecture series for this summer. Uh, Dr. Stoli Rav is presenting today, but we hope that uh, you may consider uh, joining us for the final uh, session that will be still wrapping up. We're, we're doing some final planning for it, but we're doing a 20th anniversary of the 9-11 tragedy on Friday, September 10th, and that will be virtual. So we hope you might consider attending but that session is actually expanding. So come back to the website that I'll put into the chat a little bit later to find out more in regards to who besides JQ will be presenting. So we're really excited to have that session add more people who are excited to share more. So thank you for that. All right, Dr. stoli your screen is shared and you can now begin your presentation. Okay, great, thank you, Nicole. Thank you for the introduction. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I appreciate your attention to this matter. Before I begin talking about uh, lithium ion battery fire hazard, I want to acknowledge my former graduate students, Ahmed Said, Christopher Lee, and Sean Leo. They generated about 90% of content that, go, that went into this presentation. And without their hard work, I would not be able to uh, develop an understanding of the lithium ion battery fire problem that I'm gonna share with you today. All right, so uh, as you probably know, uh, lithium ion batteries are used in a wide range and widening range of various devices and systems. Um, anyway, anyway, from personal, uh, starting from personal electronics all the way to the stationary energy storage used to um, assist the management of electrical grid. And you probably also heard that um, there has been an increasing number of accidents, fire accidents associated with these devices. These days, it seems that uh, those fire accidents uh, are reported about every other news cycle. And um, yes, the, the most recent example of this would be um, a recall of the, um, of the battery pack of Chevy Volt due to fire hazards that is projected to be the most expensive product recalled in history. And if you take in this information uh, or take this information and consider predicted trends in lithium ion battery use. Um, just about anybody, who you, any, anyone's prediction you look at projects that the lithium ion, ion battery use is gonna be increasing exponentially in the following decade. Um, so that you take that trend, you take those accidents and you realize that um, fire protection engineers are facing a considerable issue with these devices. And that issue is gonna be more prominent, significantly more prominent in the future. So let's talk a, lot, a little bit about basics. Let's talk about what makes lithium ion batteries so attractive, why they use so widely, and what makes them in general so hazardous. So the attractive part is actually fairly easy. Um, lithium ion battery chemistry provides you with by far the highest energy density. In other words, you can store much more electricity per unit volume or mass than just about any or actually any other commercial battery chemistry available. Lithium ion batteries are secondary batteries, which means they are rechargeable. And that means that you can charge them and discharge them multiple times. And in fact, in case of lithium ion batteries in particular, you can charge and discharge them thousands of times with a very little fade of their capacity, which makes them very suitable for long-term energy storage. So these are the reasons that we use them more and more. This reason, the, the, that trend is fur, further enhanced by sort of a global shift from a fossil fuel-based economy so we do expect that those lithium ion batteries and lithium ion battery based system gonna be with us for much longer and gonna be increasing in use by many, many times with respect to what we see now. 
So the underlying chemistry of the lithium ion batteries in very general terms are shown on the left pane of the slides. And I walked through it without too much details, but just to give you a general understanding of what it is. So a typical lithium ion battery, when charged, the, the, the material of cathode is subjected to potential, electrical potential that helps generate lithium ions and push them into electrolyte. The cathode material is most generally is an oxide of lithium and transition metal or multiple transition metals. Most widely used or most, most sort of um, general or, or popular chemistry is lithium cobalt oxide. So when the battery is charged, you push you pushed lithium ions from this salt to electrolyte and they are transported toward the anode. Cathode is generally a positively charged and anode is negatively charged. So lithium ion battery arrived to anode, which is usually um, a porous graphite, um, usually in a particular form. And that potential intercalates lithium ions into the graphite and they recombine with the electrons, something that is not shown on this diagram, but you end up forming essentially lithium ions, oh, I'm sorry, lithium atoms intercalated into the, the carbon structure, sometimes referred to as a lithium carbide. So this is the charging process of the system. When you remove the charging potential and instead connect it to the load, the reverse process takes place. The reason reverse process take place in principle is because those lithium atoms really much prefer to be combined with oxygen in the cathode. So it's much more thermodynamically favorable for them to be, to be chemically bound with this oxygen. So this oxygen really is very electronegative and lithium is very electropositive um, and they really like each other. So, so when you give an opportunity for the electron to travel, lithium ion, or lithium atoms ditch their electron, move through electrolyte, which is typically an organic carbonate and get incorporated back into the cathode. Practically, this system realized in various structures, like such as shown on the right top side of the slide. Typically, what you have in an actual cell, lithium ion cell, is that this cathode and anode materials are coated onto the current carriers, which are usually copper and aluminum foils. They are separated by a thin plastic separator that prevents these two touching with each other and thus sort of undergoing direct reactions. They soaked in electrolyte that provides the transport media for the lithium ions and then sealed airtight in a typically sealed steel can. Um, they vary in shape and size. Most typically it's either cylindrical or prismatic. And I forgot to mention that that roll that goes into that can is typically referred to as jelly roll. So in terms of the sizes, lithium ion batteries vary anywhere between sort of button size, very small things that can go into your watch to the size of about human fist. So those are the largest ones that are being used and they don't make them much larger than that because they run into thermal management issues for these individual cells. So now let's uh, talk a little bit about what makes them hazardous. In principle, what is the reason for this underlying accidents that we briefly mentioned in the previous slides? Well, when you take this lithium ions out of the cathode, you create a, a, um, a chemical that is too rich in oxygen and is in principle unstable. That chemical decom can decompose with the production of oxygen and that decomposition can actually be quite exothermic. So by pushing and charging the battery, you're creating an opportunity for new chemistry taking place that is not part of the charge and discharge uh, cycle. The same situation actually occurs on the anode. When you embed lithium atoms into the anode, 
they end up sitting right next to the um, organic carbonate electrolyte, which is a weak oxidizer, which is whereas lithium atoms are a strong reducing agent. So they would also like to react with each other and can produce heat. Now, these reactions, both reactions of the lithium and the electrolyte and decomposition and reaction of the cathode with electrolyte do not occur at room temperature because those reactions have non-zero chemical barrier. So, so, so there is an activation energy that is required to overcome for these reactions to occur. So at room temperature, the system is stable and what that makes, what it makes it possible for this battery to operate normally. But if you increase the temperature of that system by about 100 degrees C or so, those reactions start to take place. And once those reactions start to take place, they actually, as I already mentioned, produce considerable amount of heat and heat the media of the battery. And once they produce a reasonable amount of heat, they actually increase the rate of these very reactions because if you, Remember from your basic chemistry, the reaction is strongly dependent on temperature and increases with temperature exponentially. So you end up with a feedback loop, very strong positive feedback loop, where reactions produce heat, they increase the temperature, increase the temperature, increases the rate of reaction, increase the rate of reaction, increase the production of heat. And as a result of that, you have a rapidly accelerated process, this production, a lot of heat, and other forms of thermal energy. And that is what's commonly referred to thermal runaway. So this is the underlying chemistry of the lithium ion batteries. Now let's we'll talk a little bit about the safety features that most of the modern cells contain. So there are a few things in just about every lithium ion cell, that, at least in, a, in those that come from reputable manufacturers, that designed that are designed to help you prevent or at least uh, slow down the thermal runaway process that I just described. One of them is called positive temperature coefficient resistance resistors, and the other one is called um, current interrupt device. These two react to increased current flow and increased pressure in the cell, respectively and react by disconnecting the jelly roll from the battery terminals. Thus, they basically disconnect the battery from the external, um, external terminals when one of those things is, uh, is sensed. They are quite effective in managing such conditions as an external short circuit. So if, for example, you by accident connect positive and negative terminal of the battery, one of these devices should help prevent the catastrophic failure of the battery and the thermal runaway. They are not effective, unfortunately, from other triggers. There is a number of other possibilities by which the thermal runaway in a lithium ion battery can be triggered. For example, an internal short circuit might happen for a whole spectrum of reasons. Disconnecting the cell from the external electrical uh, circuit will not help to stop that or impact the battery. It doesn't protect against impact and it doesn't protect against external heat of heating of the battery by external source. So all these things can actually result in failure of the battery. Now, one last element, safety element that is typically incorporated in every battery is called, is called safety vent, vents. They are typically are a part of the top cap assembly of the battery. And what they do, they're basically a weakened structure of the steel can. They are burst discs. They open up when the pressure inside the battery increases above the critical weights. They don't prevent thermal runaway, but they do help prevent situations of rupture or catastrophic rupture of the steel can of the battery which may result in formation of the fine shrapnel. So this is something that, that safety vents successfully prevent. Right. So we um, started looking at the lithium ion battery safety 
about 10 years ago. And the first question that we asked ourselves was how much energy does the lithium ion battery actually generate? And where, what is the actual source of this energy in the case of failure? So we tried to answer these questions and uh, we quickly realized that there wasn't really effective and cost-efficient methodology that could provide us with such answers. So we designed our own method that we called copper slug battery calorimetry that um, actually evolved through a number of iterations and more or less final iteration is shown here on the slide. So the idea of the method of copper slug battery calorimetry is pretty simple. Again, the goal is to measure heat that is produced by a given single cells, lithium ion battery cell upon failure. And that goal is achieved by taking a cell, um, charging it to a given state of charge. State of charge is a functional given charge with respect to the nominal capacity of the cell. Is 0% indicating that the cell is completely discharged and 100% indicating the cell that is fully charged. So you, you take a given cell of interest, you charge it to a given state of charge, and you uh, place it into a copper slug, as this calorimeter indicates, that is machined to perfectly fit the cell with the exception of one surface that connects, uh, contains the safety vent force. That surface remains open. Uh, you embed thermocouples into the slug and add an electrical heater that is connected to a control, um, uh, control power supply. And you put the whole system into, insulate, into an insulator to minimize heat losses. And then you do a few calibration experiments um, and do a little bit of math. And from this temperature evolution of the cell, that occurs as you provide heating of the cell into the system, you can actually infer how much heat is being generated into the, in the cell case it itself during the thermal runaway process. Examples of the traces of the power of heat generation inside the cell shown here on the right-hand side. And you can see that we can observe this as a function of the state of charge. And you can see the sharp peaks that indicate thermal runaway. Now, if you integrate those sharp peaks, you get the total energy released inside the cell. So we, when we started playing with, with this device and performing these measurements, we quickly realized that that's not the only source of heat in the cell. During the thermal runaway, the cell ejects considerable amount of materials. And it's usually a combination of gases, um, aerosols and solid particulates. And early on, it was apparent that, you know, based on the composition of the cell, some of this must be flammable. So we looked into understanding how much energy would be generated if these aerosols were to burn. Right? And the challenge that we encountered very quickly was that um, it was fairly easy to ignite those materials with an external igniter and measure heat due to flaming combustion of the materials through sort of traditional fire protection engineering means of oxygen consumption. But each time the cell would reach the thermal runaway, the ejection rate would become so high that the flame would be automatically blown off. And that's not something that necessarily will happen in every particular situation. So we, we, we felt that it was important to capture the total combustion energy of this ejected products. So we added this sort of a cup assembly to our um, calorimeter to be able to slow down the gaseous products ejected from the cells and direct it toward the hot wire igniter. That created nice and steady flame we put the whole system under a cone calorimetry and we're, measure, we're able to measure energy production in the flaming combustion as a function of time. Example of the traces are shown on the right-hand side for one particular cell. And 
integrating this will produce will give you another source of energy, another energy, the energy produced in the flaming combustion of ejected battery materials. So we we looked at individual cells of all kinds of form factors and all kinds of different chemistries. So lithium ion um, batteries do have different chemistries of the cathode, uh, and we'll go to discuss them a little bit more later on. And we found that all of them sort of phenomenologically follow the same process that qualitatively is depicted here. So to help you understand the energy generation in this cell, I divided this process into sort of two hypothetical experiments. One is conducted without any oxygen. So you have an aerobic environment. You heat up the cell. And as you heat up the cell, you raise the pressure inside the cell because electrolyte evaporates. Your safety vents will open at a certain point. And somewhere right after the safety vents will open, you start triggering this thermal runaway inside the cell. So the heat start being produced inside the cell itself due to this chemical reactions that I just mentioned you in a couple, couple of slides ago. Now that heat, that, that this reaction will quickly accelerate. The, the cell can become red hot within seconds, usually can easily reach the temperatures of seven to 800 degrees C. And at that point, you will have also significant increase in the ejection rate of the battery materials. So this, what happens in an anaerobic environment, Environment. You don't have an external flame in this case, but you have one inch interesting feature of the cells. The, the chemicals that are being injected from the cells are not actually completely reacted with each other. So if they land on some external surface, even in the absence of any sort of external oxygen, they will continue to react produce, and produce heat. So we, 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 we refer to this heat production as internal heat generation. We're particularly talking about the heat produced inside the cell. And we also use the term chemical heat generation to indicate the heat that is produced as a result of reaction between battery materials. If you repeat this same experiment in air and you ignite those ejectiles, you will see a flame formed on the top of a single battery. As I point out, in the absence of any other devices, this flame will be going to be blown off when the um, thermal runway will set in. And then it will probably resettle somewhere at the very end of the thermal runway because the battery is super hot and can basically auto ignite this flame once the ejection rate becomes sufficiently slow. Now, in this process, the process in air, you now have basically the same energy sources as you had in an aerobic environment. But in addition to that, you also have the heat generated as a result of flaming combustion of this organic electrolytes and other materials that are present in the battery and their reaction with external oxygen and burning in a flaming combustion. So in terms of the magnitude that we're talking about, here is an example of a typical cell. This is one of the cells that we actually stripped from one of the laptops. Um, so this is sort of on the lower side of the capacity that you can find out there these days. Here on the left-hand side, we see the total energy that is released inside the cell casing due to reaction between battery material as a function of the electric energy stored inside this cell. What this data indicate is that the amount of heat that is released inside the cell due to decomposition and thermal runaway is actually higher than the energy stored. That is not surprising. Um, as I pointed out earlier, the chemistry that is responsible for generation of this heat during failure is not the same chemistry that is responsible for the charge discharge cycle. But it, it increases linearly with electrical energy stores after about 50% state of charge, which is also expected based on a sort of a chemical description of the failure that I provided before. And then it starts to flatten out after 50%. And that's what we absorb from the majority of the cells. And the reason it flattens out is because this is the point of charge where you start ejecting a lot more materials from the cells before they have an opportunity to fully react. 
So, so basically, if you were to retain all these materials inside, because we're measuring what's actually is produced inside the cell, you would set, you would expect a straight line here. And we actually showed in, in, in our calculation that it's close to straight line. But because you eject those materials from the cell, and we don't measure that part in this particular test, we do measure it in another test that I'm about to mention, you're gonna have that sort of flattening out. Now on the right hand side, you see the graph that indicates heat generation in these things due to the flaming combustion. So this is due to complete or nearly complete combustion of the organics that is ejected from the cell. And I guess it has more or less linear dependence on the energy stored as well. And if you look at the magnitude of that heat, you know that it's about a well, factor of two larger than the magnitude of the heat release due to the thermal runaway reaction between materials. So you have about twice as much heat that can be released potentially in flaming combustion due to failure with respect to the heat released due to reaction between, between the battery materials. That doesn't mean that that heat is not important. It really, the relative importance of these two energy generation processes change from one scenario to the next. So they both have to take, be taken into account. They cannot be, neither of this can be ignored in the majority of fire scenarios. All right, so we talked about single cells up to now. Now I'm gonna shift gears and talk about more frequently observed uh, systems where you have more than one cell present. Right? If you look at the majority of the devices that I showed you on one of the first slides, you recognize that those devices actually contain multiple cells that are packed very tightly next to each other in this configuration. And that's just to provide you with necessary energy density. So what happens if any one of the cells uh, fail? It doesn't take too much imagination to understand it, but here's a video that sort of help you maybe reinforce that. Can I click? Uh, all right, here it is. So in this particular experiment, we forced this bottom corner cell into a thermal runaway, and we're looking at what happens to surrounding cells. You can see the surrounding cells start to vent, and that's because, of course, the, they're being heated by the cells that, that was, was forced in a thermal runaway. And this time, they start to fail as well one by one, and that failure in this particular case quickly accelerate into full-blown fire. Now, the example that you see in front of you is six cells. Um, just to give you a perspective, um, modern car, car battery pack can contain up to 6,000 of those cells. So we're talking about 1,000 times larger fire size. So to better understand the dynamics of this failure, we designed this experimental setup shown on this, on this picture. All right, let me go back to my pointer. So at the heart of this setup is this test section right here. This test section contains a simulated battery module that we'd like to study. We, can, we have an ability here to feed a very well-defined flow of gases of known temperature and composition into this test section. And we have an ability to measure both the composition and temperature of the gases that evolve at the back end as a function of time. And that gives us an ability to understand a lot of things that happens inside the cell including various forms of heat generation and also generation of species can be quantified as well. Our simulated battery pack, a simulated battery module, I would say more accurately, looks qualitatively like this. So most of the experiments that we performed, we took three by four, 18650 cell array. So 18650 cells are the same cells that are about the size of a human finger. And we put it together in a tightly packed configuration 
we initiated failure in a one cell, which we call trigger cell, through a localized heating. And then we looked at the propagation of this thermal runaway through the rest of the cells by monitoring their temperature at the bottom of individual cells. We've done this experiments in both nitrogen and air on a fully, uh, fully charged LCO, lithium cobalt oxide cells shown on the left page. The reason we did this in nitrogen and air is because we wanted to again differentiate between the energy product in the um, I mean, it's good, reaction. It's the papers that we've read. Oh, okay. Uh, all right. Due it's to reactions. But it's good, but it's not new and exciting. No. Alex, I'm At sorry, but I need you to mute so yourself. Far. I'm sorry, I can't. Alex, no. you need to mute yourself. It's okay. <laughs> I didn't notice. Now I'm still trapped, so. Oh. <laughs> all right. So. The sun, so, so we've done this in nitrogen and air because we try to better understand how the flaming combustion of the battery materials would affect that propagation of the thermal runaway or what we refer to here as cascading failure. What we found in essence that one of the key findings was that you don't re really need air to propagate the thermal runaway through the array. It propagated in every single nitrogen test that we conducted. We also found when we examined the air tests, and just for clarity, we performed the tests on multiple um, arrays, so they were repeated multiple times, that we also need, did need to have any special means to generate um, com flaming combustion inside the tunnel. In fact, we found that the flaming combustion inside the town in the air experiments was so intense that even when we provided the airflow rate at about three meters per second into this tunnel, the combustion process consumed pretty much all oxygen that was available. And in fact, when the combustion products were ejected from the tunnel, as shown on the bottom photographs here, those have reignited uh, as a result of reaching the external oxygen at the exhaust. The, so, so nitrogen, uh, so, so air is not needed for propagation and combustion is highly intense in this system. Now we went, so, so individual tests that we conducted were not 100% reproducible. In other words, when we failed cell two, that was the trigger cell, the cells did not fail in exactly the same sequence, but we did notice that the transport of thermal runway from row to row was reasonably reproducible. So we quantified the rate of this propagation by calculating the rate of speed of transport by taking the average thermal runway time in one row and subtracting the other and taking the reciprocal of this way. So if you take one over SP, you get the timing it takes to jump from row to row. We found that in the test that did not involve flaming combustion in nitrogen, the propagation from row to row was very steady. So it, it, pro, it went through the, through the array in a very steady rate. When we added air, especially air that was added at a high rate, we found that this propagation accelerated very quickly in time. And the reason for this acceleration, and, and, and actually at the end, we observed the, the propagation rate that were order of magnitude larger than those that were observed in nitrogen. And the reason for this is of course, in this case, the flaming combustion was actually present in the tunnel. It contributed to the heating of the cell adjacent to the cell that underwent thermal runaway and basically accelerate, accelerated their failure this way. So you have considerable effect of this flaming combustion provided that the oxygen is available. Now we also looked at understanding of how different battery chemistries uh, behave in those arrays. So what I, again, gonna circle back to is that lithium ion batteries are not created equal 
they have different cathode chemistry. The most frequently or traditional cathode is lithium cobalt oxide. And most of our kind of conversation thus far was dedicated to this type of chemistry. But another popular chemistry that is why they use is lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide or NMC cells. They're typically a little larger in capacity. So those are the cells that are used in, in the devices that requires highest energy density. And another interesting chemistry is lithium iron phosphate. Lithium iron phosphate is the chemistry that was of interest to us that is widely considered to be a safe type of lithium ion battery. So we looked at their tendency to propagate cascading failure. And this graph on the top, bottom top sort of summarizes effectively those, um, those tendencies. We found that that LCO, lithium gold oxide, was a little better and slower in propagation in N than NMC. That was especially notable in the nitrogen experiments where no flaming combustion occur. And that was attributed to the fact that, that the temperature of the set of the onset of the thermal runaway of lithium cobalt oxide was about 20 to 30 degrees higher than an MC. LFP did very well on this test. In its essence, about, out of about five tests in nitrogen, if I remember correctly, none of them propagated thermal runaway. And we achieved propagation of the thermal runaway only in one air test. So this re results for the LFP look rather promising. That improved safety, of course, doesn't come without the costs. LFPs have about half, uh, half the capacity of these other cells. So if you'd like this increased safety, um, the capacity of the cells have to be sacrificed, at least within this realm of chemistry. Right, this, this is a very, um, this slide and I think I'm basically uh, short on time. So I'm gonna focus uh, only on the left-hand side of the slide. On the right-hand side of the slide, you see the information on the energetics that we extracted from the tunnel experiments. Uh, we get a lot of detailed energy information about the heat generated both in the flaming combustion and the reaction of battery materials. You can find details in this, in this link uh, to the paper that you see here. And I'll ask Nicole to post the PDF version of that, of the slides on the website so you guys can access this link if you're interested. But I'm going to focus here on the right-hand side. Those measurements indicate our measurements of key species that have been produced in this tunnel cascading failure experiments. And what this slides indicate that on mass basis, especially if you focus on LCO and NMC cells, it's sort of dominant type cells out there. You produce a large amount of hydrocarbons, large amount of carbon monoxide, and a large amount of carbon dioxide. Note, those yields are in absence of any flaming combustion. So those um, compounds are produced as a result of reaction of battery materials, primarily inside the cell cam, right? Now, Total hydrocarbons or THCs are primarily composed of methane. I was, we were very surprised by the incredibly high yields of CO. As you know, CO is highly toxic and appears, appears that those cells produce them at an incredible rates of about 1.5 grams for each cell, which is about on the order of 38, 37 grams. And most of it, is actually metal. So they have very high uh, toxic gas yields. And of course, all of these are combustibles and partially responsible for this heat generation and flaming combustion as well, except for CO2. Now, this is, if you look at it on the mass basis, if you look at it on the volumetric basis, then you see that hydrogen is actually also produced in a notable amount in the volumetric basis. And that has implications because hydrogen has a very wide flammability limits. And when it added to the mixture, it actually widens the flammability uh, limits of the mixture as well. So this is one of the reasons why um, these gas mixtures, if not burn, represent a considerable secondary explosion hazard. Right, now the question, the other question that we tried to answer that I like to get to is, you know, can we do anything about it? Can we improve the um, 
or at least mitigate the fire hazards associated with the cells. Now, there is a little, a lot of work that's going on here on the chemistry cell side of these things. I'm not really an expert in this field, so I'm not going to talk about that. But we did look at some ways of mitigating at least the cascading form of failure. So one, one thing that we looked at is to try to see if we can slow down or prevent cascading failure by sort of changing the geometry of the module. So one obvious solution would be to take cells apart. But when you do that, you of course reduce the energy density and you thus trying to engineer battery module against its main constraint, which is a high energy density per unit volume. So we thought that one reasonable solution was to consider breaking the large module into a smaller cell clusters and producing five millimeter gaps between the clusters, which is shown on the left-hand side, and potentially introducing some physical barrier into this, into this between the cells. So we did this um, experiments in the same tunnel setup. We just slightly redesigned the holder to enable a different battery, battery module design. And what we found was that air gaps production of air gaps, even five millimeter gaps, which is about as large as you can afford in those densely packed pack was ineffective. You do end up increasing the timing between the successive thermal runaways in a row by about 20 seconds, but it's nowhere near to be significant to significantly affect the dynamics of the oral process, overall process. We did find that Aiding the um, physical barriers, which usually required sort of a sturdy structure like a stainless steel sheet combined with some sort of thermal insulation, and we tried different ones. That structure, when is introduced into this into this gap, actually slows down the thermal runaway progression or cascading failure considerably. We with a ceramic fiber barrier combined with stainless steel, we were able to achieve the delay of the thermal runaway of about four minutes or so, which is now considerable. So this introduction of barriers like that into the structure of the modules, you can actually reduce both severity of the battery fire and give potential occupancy, what's near human occupancy time to egress before this fire becomes severe. One last thing that I'd like to mention is tell you a little bit of our work on active suppression. So, so, so naturally, the question, the next question the fire protection engineer would ask, can we actually suppress lithium ion battery fire to some traditional or non-traditional means? And what we've done, and that again was uh, within the framework of this tunnel setup, is to look at um, a couple of suppressants, one of them what was water mist, and the other was Novak, Novak 1230, which is a halocarbon that is widely used and it's sort of considered to be a very, a very replacement for halon. We like that halocarbon in particular because it has large volumetric or molar heat capacity, so we thought it would be potentially effective in systems like that. So we basically run the experiments where we injected this halocarbon into the tunnel and looked at the thermal runaway propagation and fire development in those experiments. We used two concentr volumetric concentrations that we could very well control in these experiments. One was 8.5%, which was already above that recommended for traditional fire, but still below those that are considered below the maximum that is considered to be safe for human occupancy. And the other was twice as large. What we found from these experiments was that at 8.5%, the um, application of this suppressant was able to slow down the thermal runaway propagation, but did not stop the combustion and the propagation always was complete. In fact, we found that some of that agent actually potentially 
enhance, enhanced combustion in the stun. So we observed higher combustion efficiencies when we introduced NOAC than without NOAC. However, at 15.2%, we found NOVAC to be highly effective. We found that the combustion efficiency inside the tunnel was brought almost to zero, right? So about 20, maybe eight, maybe 15% on average. So we suppressed pretty much all flaming combustion in multiple tests. We also found that no indications of reignition in this test. So when NOVAC was delivered at a constant flow at 15%, we found that the mixtures that are formed from the battery decomposition products and NOVAC did not reignite upon exit and re-entry to the atmosphere. We also were able to suppress cascading failure itself, the thermal runaway propagation from battery to battery in about 60% of the tests, which is rather significant. So not only were we able to suppress flaming combustion, we also were able to suppress thermal runaway propagation. And the data that we collected clearly indicated that NOVAC contributed to the cooling of the cells that were sitting next to the cells that already underwent, underwent thermal runaway. And that cooling was generally responsible for that stoppage of the, of the cascading. Failure. Right, I think I'm almost out of time here and I'm almost on time, I guess. These are my key conclusions. Well, I'll try to go through them quickly. So, so these are the key points to take home. Um, when single LED cell fails, you can generate up to five times store, uh, stored electrical energy in the form of heat. Some of this energy comes from the reaction between battery materials and some of this energy, rather considerable pump, come, come from the flaming combustion of the ejected materials with external oxygen. One thing that I'd like to mention that, uh, that I forgot to mention during discussion is that sometimes people state, and I've seen it in a several, um, in, this, in a several presentation, that the batteries themselves generate enough oxygen to combust the hydrocarbons that they generate. That is not an accurate statement. Um, the batteries do release small amount of molecular oxygen, but it's nowhere near enough to combust the released hydrocarbon products. So to, to get this flaming combustion, to get the full energy out, you need external oxygen. Um, item number two. If you compare the energy generator of lithium ion batteries with traditional combustibles, such as plastics or gasoline on mass basis, you find that this heat is order of magnitude smaller. So we're talking about two to five kilojoules per gram, whereas traditional combustibles are 20 to 50 kilojoules per gram. Based on this observation, you should know that if you take 50 pounds, of plastics and you set off a bonfire and you take 50 pounds of plastics and add 50 pounds of lithium ion battery, well, the fire will not get any more spectacular than it was without the batteries, it just gets much more expensive. Early on, people have used the type of experiments to um, show presumably that lithium ion batteries are not hazardous but I don't think it's a right conclusion. Lithium ion batteries produce large amounts of hydrocarbons, carbon monoxide, CO2, and some H2 upon failure, or some of that would combust if you have flaming combustion available. Um, the, because they produce these gases, they, they, and these gases do not always burn, there is a large likelihood for formation of a explosive gas mixture, especially if these batteries are used inside a compartment, inside some enclosed environment. And we already have seen multiple accidents that involve such explosions. Lithium ion phosphate is the best, the safest chemistry on the market. It does not have the energy density that is required for many applications, unfortunately. 
Also, there are some batteries on the market, according to anecdotal evidence, that claim to be high energy density lithium ion batteries. You probably want to stay away from that because those are usually hybrids. They contain mixed cathodes and then can be as um, hazardous as LCOs. Lithium ion batteries propagation and battery pack can be mitigated by introduction of uh, physical barriers with, uh, with a good um, low heat transfer properties. And the finally, the NOVEC 1213, probably a number of other hydrocarbons can be used to suppress the batteries, but you have to use them at high concentration and use them in a high purge mode. In other words, you cannot just flood the system with this with these hydrocarbons. You have to purge it continuously for them to be effective. I'd like to thank you all for your attention.